Hi! If you're new here, here's my quick Sonic history. Lifelong fan, played essentially every game possible, often find things to enjoy in even the critically pan ones, and thought Sonic Forces was a snooze cruise. Okay, that's my life, you're caught up. Sonic Frontiers had some of the strangest announcement to release marketing I've ever seen. Forces was five years ago. Sega seemingly just aren't working with the Sonic Mania team again, and in that time we've had two very successful films, and nothing but re-releases and Team Sonic Racing to accompany them. You would have thought they'd push for something to release with the first movie, but then the second went by and still nothing. So clearly what they were working on needed time to cook. That's fine. A year ago we got a very vague announcement trailer confirming that Sonic does run in this game, and then all that IGN stuff. I'm usually very optimistic about Sonic, but no, I was extremely concerned about what I was seeing. It was an early build, yes, but it didn't look fun. But as they started to show more of the game, it did gradually look better. Were we fooling ourselves, getting into that so-called Sonic cycle again? I didn't think so. Everything we saw did look genuinely fun. And then at EGX, I actually got to demo the game myself, and I loved it. I kept coming back to the demo and speedrunning it to see how far I could get, and each time I was discovering new things and new ways to play. It was exactly what I wanted from Sonic. This was a wild journey, but we're finally here, performing for you. And I'm going gloves off with this video, so if you've not finished the game yourself, I'd suggest probably just clicking off now because there are going to be spoilers, I'm sorry. To truly talk about the ups and downs of Frontiers, we need to discuss the entire game. Much like the announcement to release cycle, Frontiers is a roller coaster. When it's good, it's some of the best Sonic has ever been. And when it's not, well, we'll get to that. Immediately, you can tell the game has different writers. Ian Flynn from the IDW comics has taken over as lead writer, and it is a night and day difference. I don't think story makes or breaks a Sonic game, but it is part of the fun. Am I saying that Sonic Adventure 2 story mode is more fun than Shakespeare? Yeah, Romeo and Juliet just die in some chapel. Shadow and Maria die in space. Do better, William. We're away from characters saying one-liners that weren't particularly funny the first time, and then repeating it as if they told a joke but no one heard it, so they just kept going, but Baldy knows her. No more of that. Frontiers is a more serious game, which for some probably sets off alarm sirens, but I like it. It's not even a return to the 2000s era of storytelling. This is something entirely different, focused much more on one-on-one -on -one character interactions. We actually get depth out of Amy, Knuckles, and Tails for the first time in 10, 15, maybe even 20 years? All that time, they've just been NPCs that occasionally come up and say a line or two to Sonic, and that is all they've been. Even Tails was just a cog in the story. I mean, they're still not playable in Frontiers, but they're much more than these little guys who show up and just say a few things and then go away. They are prominent characters again. And we'll talk about each of them in a moment, but there really is great stuff that honors everything the series did before, both good and bad, and makes them better for it. Anyway, the story itself is fairly easy to follow. Eggman finds the Starfall Islands, where he discovers ancient technology left behind by a forgotten race. He's developed a new AI companion called Sage, who he uses to hack into a cyberspace portal. But as the defense systems kick in, Sage drags Eggman into cyberspace to protect him, where he stays stuck for most of the game. Meanwhile, Sonic, Tails, and Amy are investigating where the Chaos Emeralds have gone, but as they fly near the Starfall Islands, they get dragged into a wormhole. Oh, and there's also a prequel short you can watch showing how Knuckles got there. He basically finds a cyberspace portal on Angel Island, which is mysterious in itself. This is a modern Sonic game, which means it's Green Hill time! Whoa! Ugh. So this is Cyberspace, little levels designed to play more like traditional linear Sonic, and it's also our first impression of the entire game. I'll go in depth about how I feel about cyberspace in the open zone soon, but it's an okay introduction. Just a little playground to show you how to jump, run, homing attack, and communicate the basis of movement to newcomers. It's fine. Doesn't stand close to the best Sonic openings like Emerald Coast, City Escape, or hell, even other Green Hills, but you'll quickly discover that cyberspace is not the most important aspect of Sonic Frontiers. Unlike his friends, Sonic is able to break free from cyberspace, but then Dorman from Shadow of the Colossus says you must defeat the Titans. Don't worry about the consequences. And we're off! This is Sonic Frontiers. I've heard it described many times as open world, but I really don't think that's what this is. It's a sandbox game like Mario 64, Sunshine, and Odyssey. 
There's a collectathon aspect of finding keys from either spots in the overworld or completing cyberspace challenges, which releases Chaos Emeralds, and once you get enough of them, you can open your way to the island's Titan and on to the next area. Areas are much bigger than 3D Mario, but also Sonic is much faster than 3D Mario. I honestly think the sandboxes are really comparable. This is not open world. And I'm thrilled to say that! Smaller self-contained challenges are way better for platformers than following waypoints and doing trailing missions or fetch quests. Much like Odyssey, Frontiers is about forming your own path. You do get little markers pointing towards Chaos Emerald Shrines or story cutscenes with Sonic's friends, but the actual progression of finding keys, challenges, cyberspace levels, that's all in your own hands. After decades of linear design, Sonic is finally in a free, open sandbox, and it's really good. The opening segment of the Kronos Island takes a slightly linear approach to reel you in. Some basic combat tutorials and very simple puzzles, but then you're free. And you might think, um, John, you're actually not free. There's a small area first teaching you to find keys and get the first emerald, and you can't actually leave this area until you get the emerald. But no, screw that. Whee! That's the best part of Frontiers. It's janky in a very good way, where you can skip over entire chunks of mandatory sections, which is something I've wanted back in 3D Sonic for years. Adventure was incredible at this, and Frontiers comes really close to being as good. So let's talk about movement. Bizarrely, in a good way, you can configure how Sonic actually moves. At the start of the game, there's two options, one that favors speed and one that favors precision. You can make him turn faster, run faster, and even control the looseness of his launch physics. It's really good stuff. And you know, it's great that we can make Sonic quick, but I've wanted Sonic Team to slow him down in 3D for years now. The boost formula's great. Unleash, colors, and generations are a lot of fun, but they're also unsustainably designed. People complain about forces being three hours long, but so are colors and generations. We just didn't criticize them for it because they were fun. The developers spend years crafting these sprawling levels. Some cram more elements into a single level than other platformers have in their entirety, and then we run through them in like, three minutes? Sonic's actual design too, I mean the boost is essentially an invincibility button. It is fun to run through enemies as if they're nothing, but there's never an incentive to let go of that button. In Unleashed Generations at least, you very rarely run out. It's just so easy to keep filling that gauge up, why would you let go of the button? Boost Sonic is definitely good, it's definitely fun, but I didn't want it to be the foundation forever. Slowing Sonic down not only gives us more control and allows him to introduce actual platforming outside of the 2D moments, but there's much more they can do with the actual level design itself. You can maybe still rival Boost Sonic's speed when you max out your ring count and go into the movie Sonic Blue Aura mode, but they've brought back something from Lost World of all things, being the run button. They still call it a boost, but we know it's a run button. It's good. It was good in Lost World too. I'm tired of pretending it wasn't, but especially here, it feels really great. Sonic is simply responsive, and he hasn't been that in a very long time. Like when using the Psy Loop, you can actually draw pictures, that's how precise it is. You couldn't turn like this in the Boost games. Sonic was purposefully quite slippery, and so actual precision was just in the 2D sections. In fact, I don't think any character in a video game has controlled this well at high speed. While on the ground, Frontiers is simply excellent. So let's talk about when he's in the air with the jump. If you watched my Forces video, you'll remember I hated that jump. It had a weird, almost Mario Brothers arcade rigidness to it, where you could barely move once you're in the air, and it never felt good, especially in 2D. Now, Frontiers clearly uses Forces as a base, much like how most sequels were, that's not strange. It has changed a lot about how movement properties work, and that does include the jump, but I still don't think they've got it quite right. My biggest issue is you simply cannot turn around instantly once you're in the air. Sonic has to physically turn in a circle, so if you want to quickly realign yourself or make a precision movement, you don't always have room to do that. Mario Odyssey? Nails it. Sonic Adventure? Nails it. Even Sonic Generations nails it. The guy has done this before. But for some reason, Frontiers in this respect is nearly as rigid as Forces. The hardest thing for me to do in this game was just catching this red ring in the air. It's not moving, it's completely static, but I just couldn't quite get it. You also for some reason lose all your momentum once you're in the air. It's unfortunately more of forces rearing its head. The only way to really get a burst of speed is by dashing in the air, a move I do like. And yeah, fortunately other aspects of platforming do their best to make up for a lackluster jump. 
The double jump is back, and I'm still not particularly happy about it becoming a mainstay of 3D Sonic, but at least in the open zone, I think it works much better than Colors, Lost World, and Forces. There's a lot of suspended vertical platforming sections, and I know it wouldn't be much fun if you fell down and had to repeat big chunks of them, so I understand why there is some kind of safety net here. It's not a fix for a jump I don't particularly enjoy, but it does put a little patch on it at the very least. But yeah, that mid-air dash, it's an awesome move. This actually can turn you around instantly, unlike the jump, but unless you're really precise with the stomp, it's not exactly going to help you with precision platforming. What it is good for, though, is exploiting level design. There's nothing quite like completing an obstacle course and getting the memory token, but then dashing in the air into another section and bypass it entirely and just snagging another one in the air. It's great for cyberspace, great for the open zone, and just fun in general. I have my issues with the jump mechanics, but there's a ton of good elements in here that make it fun just to move Sonic around. It's more enjoyable to just aimlessly run around an open zone than it is to properly play Sonic Forces, and I mean that earnestly. It's just fun to move in this game. And mixing that movement with discoverability is a perfect match. There's secrets everywhere across the island. There's memory tokens that you can find that unlock cutscenes with mandatory story characters. There's obviously keys and cyberspace chambers to get the Chaos Emeralds. And none of these elements have big markers that say, GO HERE! It's all decided by you. That is unless you unlock more of the map, which does reveal icons, but even then, you don't have to look at them on the map. The map system is far more Breath of the Wild than it is Mario Odyssey. I mean, right down to the element that unlocks them, which is frankly... Koroks. You can argue they're not Koroks, but you'd be lying to yourself and me. So think about that before you do. Big old question mark spots cover the island with tiny little puzzles. Doing them both gives you a health or defense token, and fills part of your map. The puzzles themselves range from running to a specific spot, putting out a flame in a specific way, making two structures match, following a spark on the ground, or skipping with a jump rope. Hey, that, that one's Odyssey! They're for sure not original, but it does somewhat succeed at replicating Breath of the Wild. You know, seeing a curious anomaly in the world and being drawn towards it. But I think it also ignores why Koroks are actually interesting. I've heard all the arguments about Koroks being bad, but I think those arguments also ignore why they're actually pretty fantastic. See, the actual puzzle aspect of Koroks and their rewards, I agree, aren't necessarily great. But where Koroks succeed is they make you at all times pay attention to the world, and when parts look a bit strange, they catch your eye. Like, oh, there's something weird looking about these trees, or that rock is in a suspicious place, or why is there a chain coming out of this well? You're rewarded for paying attention to the world and not just following a mini-map like most open-world games. The actual puzzles themselves and the rewards may not be outstanding, but catching your eyes is what makes them addicting. And Sonic just has big question marks. On one side, yeah, that's not the same thing. But on the other, Sonic does run much faster than Link, and you probably wouldn't notice all the oddities in the world in the same way. It does take away the discover factor, and makes the act of puzzle solving more repetitive, with the aspect of really looking for them being taken away. Especially as Frontiers has a much smaller pool of actual puzzles than Breath of the Wild, and none of them really posing much of a challenge. But it does succeed at making the world more interactive, much like Breath of the Wild. Don't worry, that's probably the last Zelda comparison. I don't think the games are actually that similar. So let's talk about combat! I was pretty worried about this aspect of the game. Enemies with health bars in Sonic games scare me. They've only ever really been fun when they're integrated into the flow of platforming, and anything that has a health bar sends immediate red flags. Heroes maybe sometimes got away with it, where Knuckles can defeat them in one punch, but Sonic can't because it's a switching character game, but then there were moments like this where it locks you in an arena and you can't progress until you've beaten up a bunch of enemies, and many of them have big health bars. Absolutely not! It's a slog to stop progression to beat up a bunch of enemies, and so stopping to defeat a bunch of robots didn't sound very appealing, but it is actually pretty good. The biggest improvement to past examples is how combat is an extension of movement. What I mean is to dodge left and right, use the quick step you'd use in general platforming gameplay. Homing attacks are the same, and if you keep pressing the button, you just start punching them in the air. And the Psy Loop is a fantastic move, fully integrating running into an attack, the most sonic thing possible. It's quick, it's responsive, and you can use it on multiple enemies at once. Now, there are a few enemies that are a bit tedious, like having to use the Psy Loop to get their shell off and then punch them, and then Psy Loop again, and then punch them again. It gets less tedious as you unlock more moves, but there's still some late game enemies that just aren't that great to fight because of this. And that's another thing I feared, the skill tree. These are my least favorite AAA trope. I want to burn all the skill trees to the ground. 
I like them less than having to squeeze through walls and following NPCs who stop moving if you get past them and you have to go back and talk to them, they continue talking. Actually, I hate all those things, they're all bad. Anyway, skill trees. I think they can work in traditional menu-based RPGs, like Dragon Quest XI. There it makes sense to forge an upgrade path to unlock specific moves, but in action-based open-world games it's so tedious. You sometimes glance at your artificial level that grows just for doing things you'd do anyway, like story missions. And then, whoa, you've got a bunch of icons that you can't really read because the font is too small, and the abilities aren't interesting because they can't be put into the game design because they're entirely optional and inorganic. I could talk about skill trees for an entire video, but I won't because I'll get angry. Anyway, it's not actually that bad here in Sonic Frontiers. I did unlock everything by the start of the third island, which did kind of make me question having it here in the first place given the lack of quantity and general ease of unlocking everything, but it meant I rarely had to pause the game to look at a spiderweb. It basically just gives you new moves for combat. You still start with the basics, but it kind of makes sense you wouldn't have the most powerful stuff right at the start of the game. I still wish it was earned through discovering them via the world and gameplay rather than a bunch of menus for a skill tree, but it's not that egregious. Although, the game does get so much easier with these powerful moves, even boss fights are over so quickly with these later abilities. The game doesn't really grow with the combat, which is a pretty major fault to be honest. Anyway, we're going further ahead. Kronos! I like this island quite a lot. I originally thought the realistic art style would make it look like an Unreal Engine 4 demo, but in practice, it does succeed at making Sonic feel out of his element in a good way. It can be a beautiful game. The time of day transitions are gorgeous, and on PlayStation 5 and Series X, you get a really smooth 60 FPS. And yeah, there's poppin'. And no, it's not good. There weren't many instances where it actually impacted my gameplay, but it is very weird seeing the world just sort of grow in front of you, with no fade in. Just boop! Oh look! Platforms! Even with technical issues though, Kronos looks great, and with its openness, it's a joy to explore. I actually think this is the best island in the game, there's very few linear segments. Like every other island going forward has a ton of set pieces pushing you in a particular direction, but Kronos? Not so much. I mean there's for sure some springs and rails, but for the most part, the direction you go in is the direction you want to go in. It's pretty flat in structure, I think verticality could work well if Sonic could climb up structures with ease, but climbing is usually done through platforming challenges, and they're only really fun the first time you do them. Not so much the seventh time. Kronos just kind of nails the limitations that Sonic has. I also mostly like the unique mini-bosses. The tower's really fun, cause you could just stand around smacking the layers off it, or you can jump off from a high distance and just go for the head. Ninja's great at testing reflexes, and the squid is so fun to jump onto. But the camera isn't fantastic here. You're meant to run along this road where they shoot a bunch of projectiles and you dodge them, but sometimes the camera just turns in a way that you can't see where they're coming from. I like the idea of it, but this one's just not my favourite to actually attack. And speaking of the camera, you can actually control it! Adventure let us nudge it around a little bit when it wanted to, and you could move it in Unleashed hubs. But we've never had this level of control in actual gameplay. We've never really needed it, and thankfully it's usually pretty good. The shortcomings mostly come in when the game takes control away from you, like sometimes challenges go, oh yeah, go this way, but then the camera's framed in the opposite direction, which is not great. Sometimes the occasional fixed angles aren't always ideal either, but it is nice having so much control over the camera now. It feels free in the same way that Sonic feels free. The open zone in general is delightful. I have criticisms, and I've seen the criticisms of others, and I can acknowledge and agree with many of them, but very few detract from how fun the game can actually be. To me, this is the kind of game that makes it blatantly obvious that putting numbers on media has very little meaning. What does an 8 or a 7 or a 6 actually mean? It's easier to skim an opinion that has a numerical result without actually reading the context of why someone feels that way, but that's also a big problem. These numbers don't mean anything, it's all in the text. To me, Sonic Frontiers is more fun than most games I've played this year. There's absolutely room for improvement, and we've still got plenty of those to talk about, but when the core flow is this good and this interesting, I am largely happy. Sandbox Sonic works, and if I see one more person say Sonic can't work in 3D, they're going in the box! You don't want to go in the box, do you? So, what about Cyberspace? This one was confusing to a lot of people going in, as they were blatantly reusing level designs from previous games, like Generations, Unleashed, and even Adventure 2, with the visuals of Green Hill, Chemical Plant, Sky Sanctuary, and for some reason, a brand new template with the city area. Those elements actually didn't really bug me. 
Yeah, I am very tired of them reusing visuals and level designs after Generations, Mania, Sonic 4, Forces, but considering cyberspace is only a small pillar of frontiers rather than the focus, I wasn't that worked up over it. However, I simply don't think the mechanics transfer over very well. One of my few compliments to Forces was the homing attack was really fast and nice, but Frontiers obviously uses it for combat rather than just platforming, so they went for a more powerful feeling move which works great for the open zone, but works awfully in cyberspace. If you're going for an S rank, it's so much faster to ignore all the enemies. They're a detriment to any run. But what I don't get is there are variations of the homing attack. Like balloons, for instance, give you the nice quick forces ones, so why wasn't that applied here in cyberspace? I mean, the balloons here do that, but why not the enemies? I, I don't get it! Movement also feels different here. I think they for some reason changed it to the more rigid forces style, and sometimes levels are taken straight from generations where Sonic was much looser and had a drift, and in those levels I just bounded into walls, there's no quick way to get around anymore. But what's really weird is there is a drift in one level. One. And you're always drifting. You can't stop, it's very weird. They're generally pretty good at selecting levels that do see the Frontiers playstyle, but especially when the camera shifts to 2D, the ugly jump mechanics just turn their head. It's not as bad as Forces, but it's not great. I do like the exploit though, where where you dash when doing a homing attack animation, you just go flying. Obviously not intentional, but it is very fun. It can make some of these pretty fun to speedrun. I did kinda like seeing some Adventure 2 stuff return, White Jungle was particularly neat. The music's also incredible in cyberspace. I mean, the open zones have these calming melodies, which makes sense. You don't want to hear the same bombastic track on repeat for three hours in a go. But these cyberspace levels continue the genre that Force is used for the Avatar stages. And you know, those were some of the best tracks in the game. Some of the only good tracks in the game. I really like the track in 1 2, and that's probably because I heard it so many times trying to get that flippin' S rank. It's a little flippin' flippo. I swear, when I demoed this game at EGX, I got all the requirements of this stage in a single run, on my first try. They outright changed that late in development for the final release, I swear they did. And I can't decide if that's genius or a weird inconsistency, because practically every other cyberspace level I 100% in one try or a couple of tries. But this one, I was here for like 30 minutes trying to figure out what I was doing wrong. Finishing with the right number of rings and red rings, easy. I was going as fast as I can and taking the trickiest routes, ignoring all the enemies, but I was still falling way short. Well, unlike most other levels, you actually have to go the low route in 1-2 to succeed, which in most Sonic games is the slow route. But no, you've really got to optimize your run here, which in the moment I couldn't figure out what was up. But looking back, I kind of like that a level so early on tests you so much. It's just weird that no level ever does it again. Finishing practically every other level with an S rank is very easy. This one I did with 10 seconds left, this one 15, 20, a full minute? But even with going the most optimal route, I still barely cleared one too. It's very weird, but I wish there was more of it. It is fun to plan a perfect route, but most of them go in the opposite direction of being far too lenient. It is kind of deflating to get all the medals on your first tries, like, oh, that was that. And with how short and basic some of these levels can be, I'm not entirely sure I'll be returning to them ever again. At least not in the same save file. Although some of the red rings are funny, some are put directly on the critical path and are impossible to miss. Like this one's right before the goal, you can't possibly miss it. Most go for the higher route, which makes sense because that's the trickier route to stay on, but a few are actually scattered around on both the middle route and the low route, and that kind of encourages exploration. I'm definitely more iffy on the mechanics of cyberspace than I am the open zone, but I still enjoyed a good chunk of them. They're for sure almost all incredibly short, and some border on being way too basic, but there's legit some cool levels in here, especially the completely original ones. Like the ones taken from generations can sometimes feel a bit too slow and empty, considering the mechanics weren't built for them, but a decent chunk were made specifically for Frontiers, and they're easily among the best. 4-1 is my favourite in the game. Like just having Green Hill and chemical plants all floating in the background, it's fine. But all these different highways floating around looks fantastic. I love the depth and alternate routes here as well. A lot of levels have alternate routes in 2D or just have some floating vertical platforms, but I love being able to just dive into a loop and access a totally different part of the level. And the music here rocks. 4-1 is so good. Cyberspace does have its problems, not gonna blow past that. The jump losing all its momentum means I never quite know if I'm going to make it into a loop or if I've got to dash into it. Mechanically, it doesn't all work, but it can still be fun despite all of that. 
Slower, deliberate control does wonders for frontiers, and there's also a really nice lack of teeny tiny platforms that plagued colors and forces. The evil has been defeated. Oh, also, the lightspeed dash is back. It doesn't really feature very much, but it is here. And there's a positive and negative there. Uh, for some reason, you lose all momentum after pulling it off, and I don't know why. It doesn't feel very good. But they've mapped it to L3 now, and given it's a move you rarely use, I love that. Pressing B in Adventure 2 was always scary. You either wait for the icon to appear before pulling it off, or act in bravery, knowing there's a 50-50 chance you'll roll off the edge instead. Big mapping improvement, I'm ecstatic to see it back, but they need to work on momentum for the next game. All in all, Cyberspace is a great change of pace, and the quickest and most enjoyable way to earn keys. It's almost like how Odyssey would occasionally have linear 3D world style sections. The sandbox can provide all that exploration and freedom, but it's still nice to have a chunk of deliberately designed platforming challenges, even if I think they are mechanically quite flawed. Before we move on, every island also has a fishing cyberspace portal where Big has magically appeared. No one knows how he got here and whether he's still there by the end of the game. He doesn't leave with the others, so he might be there forever. You need to use purple coins to fish with Big, but I would not worry too much about that. Just do your own thing, you'll probably never run out. Fishing is incredibly basic. It doesn't matter where you throw your rod, the fish under the water aren't really there, and they will bite regardless of where you go. There's no timing in starting to catch the fish either, just keep mashing X and eventually it will just start. And then you've got the most forgiving timing in the world to catch it. It is incredibly slow for some reason. It does get a little more complex towards the end, but it's still extremely easy. The lo-fi music keeps the chill atmosphere up, but this is simpler than Animal Crossing. Like, look, if you're gonna do a fishing minigame, don't be scared to give us actual fishing mechanics. This just feels like a cheap way of getting memory tokens, cyberspace gears, keys, and a bunch of other unlocks. Like, you can do a big bulk of the game just by fishing, and that's cool. I just wish it were a bit more than, like, this. It's nothing really, just a chill song and pressing a button. But I do like seeing Big again. Speaking of pressing a button, I hate leveling up so much! Leveling your attack and defense, easy, that's so simple. You just collect orbs that are generally found in puzzles and around the world, and you bring them to this fella. You can very simply go from level 1 to level 15. No probs, easy. But this son of a bitch, oh, this son of a bitch. To level speed and rings, you must collect the cocoa that's scattered around the island. But instead of working like the other upgrades, you can only go one level at a time for some reason that I can't possibly fathom. Not only does the animation take a long time to finish, but the default option that comes up afterwards is cancel. You can't just keep mashing accept, you've got to pay attention, and leveling up the whole thing can take an hour. I got every trophy in this game, but I will not get the one for leveling up rings and speed. I will waste my time doing many things, but not this. Surprisingly though, there's like 8% of people who did do it. You're nuts. You're all nuts. I don't even see the point in leveling rings up. I think I did it like 4 or 5 times in my entire playthrough. It gives you more hit points, but you can just always draw more rings with a psi loop anyway, so I never needed it. Outside of finding keys for Chaos Emeralds, you also need to talk to Sonic's friends who are being held captive on each island. They're kind of stuck between cyberspace and reality. A few of the times you talk to them, you'll get little minigames for emeralds, so you can't ignore these. Alright, one more Breath of the Wild comparison. That game made story completely optional, and many complained about it. I think Sonic Frontiers shows why it's not always great to interrupt the gameplay. I mean, the point is to be open and free, right? But there's always pretty much a waypoint saying, hey, go talk to the character. The actual dialogue here is good stuff, but there are plenty of moments where I spent all my time doing everything on the island and being free, and all that remained was talk to Amy, talk to Amy, talk to Amy, talk to Amy, talk to Amy. Suddenly I was following waypoints like a generic open world game, and it was a bit dull. But again, I enjoyed the actual dialogue itself. We haven't seen Sonic and Amy together in a very long time, and I don't think we've ever really seen them properly talk to each other outside of the tropey, ah, run away from Amy. It may sound silly to dive deeper into the sides of these plucky mascot characters, but it really is nice seeing more depth to all of them. Amy isn't a damsel. She'll encourage Sonic, but not in a, ah, my knight in shining armor kind of way. What Frontiers is great at is remembering the past and building upon it to make something greater. It can sometimes feel a little forced, like they'll drop lines of trivia from decades ago, like I'll be back before you can do a fortune card reading. See ya! She hasn't done that in 25 years, man! They also sometimes mention characters that have never been seen in video games. I guess they weren't lying when they said everything is canon. Even Boom is canon, apparently. What? 
but it is great to have grown up with this franchise and have that kind of rewarded, whether it's just name-dropping locations or bullying Zavok. I bet Zavok would feel right at home here. Wonder how he's doing. Terrible, I hope. <laughs> Flippin' Zavok, yeah, burning hell. Ian Flynn, we'll get to Tails later, but thank you. We get small glimpses into Sage's world as she protects Eggman from cyberspace and tries to discourage Sonic from attacking the Titans in the real world. There is more to Sage, but it's all kind of shrouded in mystery, at least on this island. Still, I really enjoy her. Right from the start, she's a very fun character. The formula for each island is kind of the same, like you just kind of go around, find keys for Chaos Emeralds, get a few from the character quests, and oh no, where's the seventh one? I bet the Titan has it, and so you do an intensive puzzle and open the path to the Titan. Kronos has this light one, and I'm ashamed to admit this took me longer than any other puzzle in the game. Was I alone? I only see people complaining about the pinball one, and honestly that one didn't really do much for me, that was just kind of a simple one, but this light one? Too much for my small little brain. Then you easily climb the Titan, take the 7th Emerald, and it's heavy metal time. God, these supersonic battles are so good. I missed supersonic being used as a climactic finale so much. Ever since Colors, he's just been a 100% reward. I mean, Generations did have a supersonic final boss, but it certainly wasn't climactic, and Forces made him DLC, which is the exact opposite of climactic, that is nothing. Here though, hella strong music, giant even galleon looking robots and projectiles flying everywhere. We're flying again too, it's been so long since the supersonic flew. And combat's just an extension of normal gameplay, but way flashier, so moves like Wild Rush look absolutely nuts. I will say though, the parry move does make everything way too simple. On my first Titan fight, I was getting knocked around a bunch and it felt a little tough. But then I started parrying, and the parry window is so big that everything just becomes a bit mindless. And when I say the parry window is big, I don't just mean like, a second long. I mean, it's like this. Still going. Still going. Yeah, it's that long! What's very funny is there's parrying puzzle challenges around the island, even up until the very end of the game, and this is all you do! Anyway, Supersonic, outstanding. I love how flashy it is and how hard it goes. This is what I want from Sonic finales, and it's just one of many. And that is the gist of Kronos. We can get through the others way faster though, so this is Ares, the second island, and a sandy zone. Just like Kronos, I think it looks great, and the lack of grass popping in, if anything, makes it look more visually polished. There's also these stunning oasis areas, and I love how it looks at night. Although this is where I first encountered the Starfall event, which happens randomly throughout the game. Sometimes when night sets, a bunch of comets fall to the ground, and you've got to collect them to power a slot machine. And it doesn't go away until morning. I mean, you can ignore the meteors, which is pretty hard because they're everywhere, and it's not power the thing, but it doesn't go away! You get bonuses like fishing coins, a bunch of cocos, rings, but my god, I don't want any of this! Go away! Why is it so big? This takes up so much of the screen, and you're already blinded by the meteors shining everywhere, but you just can't see what's going on. I don't know how this made it into the final game, it's dreadful. Die, Starfall event, I don't want you around here no more. But yeah, Ares is generally very good. I think some of the mini-bosses outstay their welcome, like the Grime Rail one, which is fine for the first phase, but if you don't drain all their health in the smacky portion, it goes on to another, more tedious phase, and I don't have time for that. This shark one too is very basic, you just kinda do quick time events for a very long time, and then you smack it, but again if you don't kill it, it does the whole thing again, so get out of here shark! But I do like the tank, where you time your hits in the sandstorm and then go all out, and sumo where you bound off the edges of the arena, those rock! Ares is at its best when you've got these sweeping vistas of land. It's often one of the more open zones, but it falls apart a little with the one-way systems. There's plenty of flat and vertical segments with one-way boost pads and springs, and it's kind of counterintuitive to what being open means. There's also a few segmented islands that you can only get to via grind rails. Some are just for Chaos Emeralds, and you never really go there again, so I have no issue with those. But others like this, though, are just kinda tedious. Like, to finish the game 100%, there was one optional Knuckles conversation I needed to do, but the path to him had a bunch of linear platforming segments, and I couldn't be bothered to do them. So instead, I got close enough, which in itself was still a rather linear path, and then exploited the mechanics. I think the bigger problem is you end up doing a lot of the same stuff again. Discovering them and exploring is still fun, but all those puzzles from Kronos? They're pretty much all here again with slight variations. 
We do unlock a new move through the story though, and this just further confuses skill trees for me. See, these ones are optional, these moves are not. But there is actually no division between the importance of these moves, they are both just as optional in the grand scheme of combat. Makes no sense to me. I don't think Ares is as strong as Kronos, but the story with Knuckles is frankly excellent. Knuckles and Sonic's rivalry has honestly never had this much chemistry, and Knuckles finally has a consistent story too. He hasn't guarded the Master Emerald since, wait, Adventure 2? And now his motive is to get free so he can return to Angel Island. And Knuckles has a pretty deep connection to Ares, with much of the architecture resembling Angel Island. He wonders if the race that once lived here predated Echidnas and even became his tribe. They even kind of resemble Chaos, which of course has tight ties to the Master Emerald. And there's an awesome moment where enemies go to attack a set of ruins that resemble Angel Island, and we get a flashback to Knuckles meeting Sonic on Angel Island from Sonic 3 to show how much it means to him. I don't think we ever conclusively learn the origins of Angel Island, but it's still great seeing a more personal and determined side of Knuckles again. Just like Amy, it's been so long. Although screw the Sandstorm minigame, it's like hoarding goats in Twilight Princess, except sometimes the goats drop bombs and sometimes there's a sandstorm. I didn't like it. This one was pretty fun though. By this second island, I was starting to feel some repetition kick in. The game was still a lot of fun, but I think it was running out of new things to show you pretty early on. I saw a few reviews saying like, oh, Sonic Frontiers is always changing its genre, but it honestly rarely does that. Ares has three minigames, and one of them's just the path to the Titan. And by the way, I think this one works better depending on the time of day. When I first started doing it, the shadows weren't really casting directly on the ground, and that made depth perception a little hard. This is actually a stupidly simple game, but yeah, for some reason, no shadows. Maybe they should have fixed the time of day for this one. But the boss of this area kicks butt though. You've got the shadow of the Colossus feeding climb and struggle to hold on, but then you become supersonic and start punching him and making missiles fly into his face. You even parry missiles. That's such a cool thing to do. It was definitely over a lot quicker now that I was parrying right from the start, but still, the spectacle of diving between missiles and getting it to launch dozens of them straight back into its mouth and blowing itself up was awesome. Ares wasn't perfect, but it was still a lot of fun. Chaos Island though, oh boy! Raise your hand if your favourite part of Boost Sonic are the 2D sections. If your hand is up, you deserve this island. The open zones have been pretty much entirely 3D up until this point, which makes perfect sense. It's a game about freedom and exploration, and you simply cannot explore when stuck to a linear plane. And so for some reason, this island is full of linear 2D planes. They just kick into gear when you least expect them. Any speed boost or spring, probably gonna take you to a linear 2D plane. And some of them are crazy long too. I simply don't get it. I don't get how you can base your game entirely around freedom and then do something like this. You return to the same areas a lot in Frontiers, as is the nature of a sandbox. And with all these different paths for memory tokens and upgrades, it can become hard to work out which of these 2D areas you've been to. I'd sometimes only begin to recognize them midway through, and by then, escaping them can be tough. Easiest way is to just fall off when you find a chance, because obviously you can't just walk off. You're 2D now. I don't know what they had in mind here. And further to that, they took Ares' segmentation and went even further with masses of amounts of grind rails dividing segments of Chaos Island. This is easily my least favorite island. It was still fun to skip segments of land just by exploiting the physics, but I shouldn't have had to do that to have fun. And sometimes just standard basic ass enemies just drop important items like gears and memory tokens. And if you're in 2D, they for some reason still operate as if they're 3D and they can fall off. I can't count the amount of times that I just had to deliberately fail a 2D section to find an item that fell off during that section. I mean, I guess I could have finished them and come back, but I don't trust that one, I could have found it again, and two, that it would have even still been there. At the very least, Chaos Island does redeem my boy Tails. Yeah, Forces had a very dumb story, but Tails hasn't been Tails in decades now. It's not just Forces. The last time he was properly playable, if we ignore Boom, was 06, and that's only the second time he's been playable outside of a mech in 3D. In Frontiers, they fully bring attention to Tails' inconsistent character traits. Sometimes he's brave, sometimes he's not. Sometimes he saves the day, other times all he does is read words off a monitor. He hasn't been a hero for a very long time, and instead of ignoring all those games where Tails hasn't been written very well, they turn it around as an opportunity for growth. They fully address Tails cowering from Chaos and Sonic Forces despite defeating him in Adventure and saving the city in Adventure. With the support of Sonic, Tails wants to move past that and even have time away from Sonic to find out who he really is, not just to be a psychic anymore, which to me sounds like Sonic Adventure 3, but I don't know, I'm just guessing it. 
What's the best Sonic game? Sonic Adventure 2. What was your favorite Sonic game to work on? Sonic Adventure 2. What's the most common request you get from fans? Chow Garden. Will we ever get another Sonic Adventure game? Someday. I've seen some receive this in the opposite way, where they feel it's a cop-out excuse for bad writing, but honestly, I don't think it's any better to cherry-pick only the positive stuff to be canon. Embracing everything feels way more earned, and this was a pretty clever way around it. Chaos Island? Maybe you were worth it just for Tails. Oh, there was a very funny scene too. I think this was meant to be emotional, but for context, Eggman isn't exactly in the game very much. Sage develops a daughter-father relationship with him by flashing back to a scene that happened like... 10, 20 minutes ago? <laughs> then you just get this emotional humming for a very generic looking scene with no actual character building going on. There is good Eggman and Sage development in the collectible logs that you can read, but it's very rarely shown in the game itself, which is kind of weird. But yeah, Chaos Island. Nothing really new here in terms of puzzles and gameplay. We do have some new guardians. There's a fortress that drops giant bombs and then spawns rails and you chase it. The spider where you silo its legs. And other guardians are actually reused from other islands. It kind of feels like they were tapped on either ideas or resources by this point because 2D is really what carries the identity of Chaos Island, and I think it's quite boring. It's a similar situation to Lost World to be honest. It peaks really early on, but then it just kind of dithers for a while, and then it just kind of reuses a few assets, and then it gets much better. That's kind of Frontiers too. So Chaos Island is topped off with Pinball to open the path to the Titan, and when I played it, I thought it was fine. It was basic as hell with a very small board and physics that I don't really trust because they're very unresponsive, but I didn't lose a single ball. I just racked up a really high combo of red rings and did it relatively quickly. Thought it was basic, but moved on with my life. And then I looked on the internet and saw everyone hated it. I agree it's not good, but I don't have any horror stories about it. Supersonic maybe has some diminishing returns at this point. Maybe I was just getting better with the mechanics, but all you really do is just parry the big saw, make it go into him, and then punch him. It was fine, but it wasn't quite as exhilarating as, uh... Oh. Oh my god, okay. Okay, the ending's amazing. The Night Titan is alright, but by the time you've maxed out your skill tree, the health bar just goes down really, really fast. I wish I had better things to say than it just dying well, but the wonder was starting to wear off a little. But then, things change. The Rhea Island is a complete change of pace, where instead of starting from scratch to find new puzzles and more Chaos Emeralds, we just need to scale six towers with really cool platforming challenges on each one. This frankly rocked. Repetition had absolutely kicked in for Island 2 and 3, but here, I started to rediscover my love for the mechanics. It was a really familiar looking area resembling Kronos completely, but shaking up the gameplay was such a good idea, and the desperation of seeing Sonic weaken with each tower added a great sense of progression. It wasn't just a little checklist of towers. It's over really quickly though. Rhea's considered a full island on the selection screen, but it's just a little stopgap to get to the next main island, really. There's no optional stuff or anything to discover, it's just these six towers. Oranos is where everything comes to an end. The towers fully corrupt Sonic with cyber energy, freeing everyone else, but freezing him and releasing the voice that guided you throughout the adventure, with the twist of it being... Dorman from Shadow of the Colossus! Wait, no! Wait, no, the end! They're the same thing, apart from this one's a giant planet, okay? But with their power of friendship, Tails, Knuckles, and Amy sacrificed their forms again to bring Sonic back. He was gone for maybe 20 seconds and no one kissed him. That's a win. Eggman and Sonic team up once more to find the emeralds and have one final showdown. And when I say emeralds plural, Eggman finds one. You've got to find the other six. Oranos is for sure derivative and not exactly fresh. It looks exactly like Rhea, which looks exactly like Kronos. But it is devoid of the problems that Island 2 and 3 have. We're back in fully 3D, the island isn't very segmented, and simply running around large fields is a lot of fun. There's new guardians like Ghost, which is just raw platforming, you don't even really attack them. But this island is largely made up of powerful versions of prior guardians. Something that I can actually admire this time for a final island. It makes you feel like you've come a long way when you can beat a more powerful version really quickly. It's at least better to put them here than just randomly on the third island. There's not a whole lot more to Oranos, it's just a decent fun rop and a pretty good send-off. Even if it just feels like more Kronos. But before we go to the final battle, we've got to switch it to hard mode real quick, because otherwise it's extremely underwhelming. The first phase is the same sort of pretty basic parrying and jabbing, but there is also some bullet heli projectiles, almost like Biolizard from Adventure 2. But I was done with the main fight so quickly. I originally had it on normal mode, and all that remained was a quick flight into space, a quick time event, and credits. 
but on hard mode we get one final phase where there's clearly meant to be one, and it's an actual freaking bullet hell. Supersonic and Sage team up as a titan to fend off the end. It's a pretty intense fight. I mean, nothing of the caliber of an actual shmup, but it is pretty crazy. Way more entertaining and logical than the game just ending there, and Sage throwing Supersonic into the end and making it explode. So good. And that is the end of Sonic Frontiers. My feelings are complicated on this one, but I'm happy I feel something. That's more than Forces ever gave me. I could go on for hours listing the negatives I have with this game. I mean, I've gone on for a while in this video alone. But when it all comes together, Sonic Frontiers is fun. It's more fun than most AAA games releasing today because at its core, it has heart. It is borrowing plenty from Odyssey and Breath of the Wild, but there's also a clear identity of its own in here. And while I grew tired of the repetition, I felt combat became a bit too simple and had some fundamental issues with cyberspace, I still really admire the game as a whole and admire the time I spent with it. Is Frontiers a 7 out of 10 or an 8 out of 10? I don't care. If you want anything short and simple to judge my opinion by, it's that Sonic Frontiers is good. It's fun. It's flawed, but the positives outshine its negatives. It's a game that shows that we shouldn't be quantifying entertainment, and instead of feasting on all the negatives, we can see that there is still plenty to love. I'm excited for the future. Some of my favorite characters in this industry have been given the respect they deserve, and the foundation is looking really good. I want them to take the time to tighten the platforming, add some actual momentum to the jump, and find ways to keep things fresh for the whole runtime. Frontiers is not perfect, but it is very enjoyable, and whether this is your 50th Sonic or maybe even your first, I think it's something everyone should at least give a shot. Good game.